paladins, the divine warriors of the gods, the brave and heroic protectors of the weak, servants of the light and defenders of unbreaking oaths, the well-known good guys of every D&D setting, forces of respect and power, and they can also be cowboys. What can I do for you? My name's Paladin. I got your wire. Welcome to Historical Role, where I take the time to explore both the real-world history of D&D classes and monsters, and their various alterations throughout the editions of Dungeons and & Dragons. And, if you were paying attention to that opening, you know that we're starting with... Anytime you say. Uh, except we're, it's the Holy Ones, not the Cowboys, probably. The Paladin has one of the longest and most wild histories of any class in D&D, which is one of the reasons why I decided to make it my first video, because I really enjoy weird challenges. But it's also so long and has so many alterations that I'm going to have to split this video up in two parts, and I'm just warning you right now about it. So the first part, the video you're watching right now, is going to cover the more historical aspects of the Paladin, the real-world history such as it were. While the second part, which should be coming out next week, will cover all the alterations within the Dungeons & Dragons universe itself, while drawing comparisons to the themes and history that we present in this video today. So, with that explanation out of the way, let's get started on the history of our holy friends. We're going to be starting early, way earlier than a lot of people would guess, I think. We're starting with the original founding of Rome. It's a weird start, I know, and transitions are weird, so you're just gonna have to trust me. See. Rome's founding myths talk of a pair of brothers known as Romulus and Remus, who arrived in what would become Rome and eventually got into a dispute about where the city ought to be founded. Remus was interested in establishing the new city on the Aventine Hill, whilst Romulus was far more interested in starting the city on the Palatine Hill. They decided to handle this dispute through a concept of augury, which is basically just holy bird watching. The brothers determined that the gods would send them a symbol through the birds on which hill they should found their city upon. It's said in the myth that Romulus saw more vultures, which was a symbol for Mars, than his brother Remus, and thus should have been the victor, but it's at this point in the story that Remus loses his temper and a fight breaks out. A fight that would ultimately result in Remus's death. Remus dying secured Romulus as the founder of the city, and he built upon the Palatine Hill as he originally intended. The city was named Rome, after the victorious brother, and the stage was set for where we're eventually going in history. Now, there's a lot to this story and the founding of Rome in general that I skipped over, and that's going to be a recurring theme throughout this video. If you realize that I missed something in a historical story, know that it wasn't necessarily out of ignorance, though it could have been. We're mostly here to study the origins of the Paladins themselves, and while I'm going to take asides here and there, I don't really have the time, nor do you have the time, to explore every single detail of every story that I'm going to be bringing up. For our purposes, though, the main thing you need to take from the story of Remus and Romulus is that Rome was founded on the Palatine Hill, and the Palatine itself became quite an important hill to the Romans, with many high-powered senators and officials living there throughout the Republic. Moving forward, we're going to be focusing on one in particular. 36 BCE saw Octavian Caesar, the successor and nephew, more or less, of Julius Caesar, purchase a complex of buildings upon the Palatine after a bout of victories against his rivals. According to legend, a bolt of lightning struck within this complex sometime after Octavian's purchase, and this was a portent, one that said that Apollo himself desired the land. Octavian wasn't one to offend the gods, or at the very least he wasn't one to miss an opportunity, and he opted to build a temple upon the complex he bought on the Palatine, the Temple of Apollo Palatinus, which he then made public to the people of Rome so that they may worship in the most holy location chosen by Apollo himself. Octavian would then buy, or be granted, sources vary, a new home on the Palatine, near his recently donated temple to the people. This temple and home became really important, as Octavian would later change his name to Augustus Caesar and rise as the first emperor of Rome. With this rise of power, Octavian expanded upon the home that he had built on the Palatine. He would build it larger and further out, connecting it to the holy temple he had helped establish and creating what would be known as the House of Augustus. The word palace is actually derived from Palatine, and it's likely the House of Augustus that started this connection. That's not exceptionally related to where I'm going, but I think it's a fun tidbit of information. What is related though is that the tradition of Rome's most powerful residing upon the Palatine continued and was even strengthened by this move. Those that lived and served upon this hill, the emperor's closest retainers and friends, became known as Palatinus, roughly translated as of the Palatine or of the palace. 
This would come to include the Emperor's personal guard. The name of the Palatine Hill and the Palatinus themselves would continue to hold weight throughout the Empire's expansion and beyond, over time becoming known as the Comes Palatines, which translates roughly to Count Palatine, a title used by European counts of considerable power during the time. It also, in 312 AD, lent its name to the Scoli Palatine, who were the personal guards of the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great after the collapse of the previous Praetorian Guard that protected him. The Scoli Palatine served as the elite guard of the Roman Emperors for about a century, where they continued to exist afterwards, but became more of an organization of show than actual use. Bit of a shame since Scoli Palatine translates to schools of the Palatine, and the soldiers of the group were called scholars. And personally, I just kind of like the mental image of a bunch of librarians that beat anybody that gets too close to the Roman Emperor up. Anyways, not important. Spoiler alert for history, Rome was going to fall. And while Rome didn't collapse overnight, as it had a ton of problems that caused its eventual failings, I'm really not going to go into what happened with it in this video. The main thing you need to know is that through Rome's rise and fall, two major things happened. One, Catholicism rose to an undisputed position of spiritual authority. And two, Rome was split into the Western and Eastern Empires of Rome, with the Eastern Empire from here on out being known as the Byzantines for the purposes of our video. Western Rome fell far faster than its Eastern counterpart, fragmenting entirely by 480 AD and leaving the city of Rome itself in the hands of multiple people, though the primary people holding it were the Catholics. Western Europe fell into a state of chaos without Rome with tribes and kingdoms rising up to clash for the right to control what was once Rome's territory. The Byzantines opted to stay mostly out of these conflicts, having their own problems and a whole heap of apathy to deal with before they would care about the Western Empire. Multiple groups rose and fell out of power in this era, but what we care about most for our purposes are these guys, the Franks. The Franks were a group that rose to power along the Rhine River and started the Kingdom of Francia. They were massive expansionists, constantly growing and taking new territory through both modern-day France and Germany. They were also huge fans of the Catholic Church. One of their kings, Pepin the Short, ended up helping the church out with a series of problems in the mid-700s that would result in the donation of Pepin in 756. The donation of Pepin all but established the Papal States, giving the church undisputed control of Rome and surrounding territories. Pepin the Short then died in 768, leaving his kingdom to be co-ruled by his sons Carloman and Charles. Carloman and Charles did not get along on what needed to be done for the good of the kingdom, and were almost constantly bickering. Their differences came to an abrupt end, however, when Carloman conveniently died in 771 AD, and Charles took the reins as the sole king of the Franks. Charles would then continue the Frankish tradition of expansion, fighting wars with his neighbors to try and conquer and claim more territory. He also continued the tradition of helping the church, coming to their aid in 772 AD against the Lombard king Desiderius. The Lombards were a kingdom of people in northern Italy who had lukewarm relationships with the church and the Franks, and their king, Desiderius, had started occupying and taking lands that once belonged to the papacy under the donation of Pepin. Hoping that Charles would continue to aid the church as his father did, the Pope asked for assistance against the Lombard king, and the Franks answered. There's a lot to this war, as there is with any war, but the short of it is that Charles defeated Desiderius and proclaimed himself king of the Lombards, which inadvertently gave him territory in northern Italy. This will come up as a note later. Moving forward with Charles' very industrious career, in 778 AD, the king attempted to push into the Iberian Peninsula, or modern-day Spain, to oust the Moors that had taken over the area. Like I said before, all wars are complicated, but this one in particular didn't go great for the King of the Franks. Charles ended up beaten back and reportedly betrayed a great deal by people who had pledged help with Hispania, and he eventually pulled out from the area after establishing the Spanish March, a type of border area between the Franks and their southern neighbors. During his retreat from Iberia, Charles was concerned that the native Basques would ally with the Moors and later on become a problem for his borders and territory. To assuage his fears, he decided to attack the Basque capital city of Pamplona and tore down the walls of the city so that they couldn't be used against him if his army had to come back through the area. There's also reports that he burnt the whole city down and destroyed several villages on his way out, which is really kind of a dick move. The Basques, understandably, did not take well to this attack from the retreating Franks, and they decided to follow and ambush them, starting what would become the Battle of Ronce. Rosse. Rat. <sighs> The Battle of Rendezvous Pass. 
Record says that Charles and his armies were moving through the Pyrenees Mountains when the Basques ambushed the Frank's rearguard and baggage train, where all their supplies were. This caught the Frankish army totally off guard, and they struggled to regroup so that they could get away. Throughout this battle, a Frankish commander by the name of Roland took charge of the rearguard and rallied them against the Basques' attack. Roland and the rearguard were all but doomed in this late night attack, as the Basques had the element of surprise and knowledge of the area. But they held and they held so long that Charles and his army managed to regroup and successfully retreat through the Pyrenees, back to Francia. Roland and his troops were ultimately killed, though they succeeded in their mission to allow Charles' escape from Iberia. This story is going to become wildly important later on, but for now, just remember, Roland stood his ground, fought, and died for his king. It's a heroic story, if you leave out that it probably wouldn't have happened if Charles had just decided to leave the Basques alone in the first place. Moving away from the Franks and forward in time to 797 AD, a major upheaval had racked through the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens, the mother of the Emperor Constantine VI, had deposed her own son after a long regency over the Empire. With the removal of her son, she declared herself Empress of the Roman Empire, as the Byzantines still saw themselves as the proper heir to Rome. This became a problem for Pope Leo III, the Pope at the time, as you could guess as the Catholic Church recognized a male emperor of Rome as the head of Christianity. Why it specifically had to be male? I don't know. Sexism? Probably. Or maybe the male thing was just an excuse to keep Irene from being in charge of the Christians since she supposedly cut out her son's eyes to rise to empress. Either way, Christianity was without a leader, since Eastern Rome had a female emperor and Western Rome no longer existed, so something had to be done. And the answer was obvious to the Pope. Charles of Francia had long been a friend of the church, and even personally came to the Pope's aid in 799 when people attempted to assassinate Leo. He had a long history of defending the papacy, and owned land in northern Italy, a traditionally Roman territory. Charles even emulated the Rome of old throughout Francia, focusing on making sure weights and heights were standardized in systems, similar to what the Romans had centuries ago. It was with these thoughts in mind that on December 25th, 800 AD, Pope Leo III coronated and named Charles as the Emperor of Rome and what was previously the Kingdom of Francia changed into the Holy Roman Empire. Charles himself would also take the moniker of Charlemagne at some point throughout all this history. And if you're keeping track, by the way, this is a point in history that now has two Roman empires again, though neither of which actually hold Rome since the Papal States have it, and neither of which are actually Roman, with the Byzantines being Greek and the Holy Romans being Frankish. History is so weird and stupid sometimes. Charlemagne would go on to have a very interesting life, expanding Holy Roman influence and fighting for Christianity. Rumors would also come out that he didn't know he was going to be named Emperor of Rome and that Leo surprised him with it, but that's more just fun dressing for the whole story. What's important to the story is that Charlemagne became big throughout Western Europe and Francia, with stories coming out about him long after his death. These stories elevated him to a nearly mythical status, similar to King Arthur. And like Arthur of Avalon and many other mythical kings, he needed his own personal retainers. Ancient storytellers likely figure 12 was a good number for these retainers since it draws parallels to Charlemagne and Jesus. And as for a name, well, kings had knights. But Roman emperors? They never had knights. They had the Palatinus. They had the Scole Palatine, named after the holy hill chosen by the gods. And Charlemagne was no less of a Roman emperor than those of old. Therefore, he didn't have knights. He had paladins. And just to make it clear when I say paladins in this context, that's a translation of likely another translation. There's multiple things that the paladins of old stories could have been called, depending on the language the stories were being told in. Paladino, palatines, whatever. The point I'm trying to make with the connection is that the original idea and mythos of paladins comes from here, with their names taken ultimately from the Palatine Hill in Rome. The stories of Charlemagne and his twelve peers, or paladins, became massive throughout Western Europe in the early 11th century, culminating in a collection of songs known as the, uh... Chanson de Geste. I am so, so sorry if you're French and trying to watch this video. I'm going to butcher your language, but I promise I'm not trying to. The Chanson de Geste, as I said, is a collection of songs. Each of these songs is a... Uh inexplicably long. Each of them were likely sung over a period of several days, with the singers taking regular breaks. Imagine them as like a 10-hour version of Old Town Road. These songs always star Charlemagne and his 12 peers, detailing events that were typically more fantastical than historical and spiced up with 11th century romanticism. They were a touchstone of the early 11th century, likely sung regularly throughout nobles' halls and as entertainment at parties. 
The most important of these for us is Shans on Dev Roland, a heavily romanticized retelling of the Battle of Rendezvous Pass. Shans on Dev Roland establishes a few things for us here in the lore. Namely, Roland, the previously mentioned rearguard commander in Rendezvous Pass, is not only one of Charlemagne's 12 peers, but also Charlemagne's nephew. This is likely not historical, but it makes the song more compelling and sets Roland up as a prime example of what the paladin should be. The actual narrative of Shans and Roland follows Roland and the other 12 peers of Charlemagne as they're portrayed from within and end up assaulted en masse by the Cerisians. Much like in real history, the assault comes as Charlemagne is attempting to escape from the Pyrenees, and the armies of the godly emperor are caught unaware. Though this time they're unaware because of the aforementioned betrayal, rather than the fact that it came as a midnight ambush that Charlemagne and his troops were just not ready for. This betrayal and ambush leaves Roland and the Twelve Peers as the guardians of the rearguard, whose job it is to fight off the Cerisians until such a time that Charlemagne can regroup. The Twelve Peers know that the battle is a lost cause, but they stand firm in the face of death to try and secure safety for their emperor, and by extension, Christianity. There's a lot in this song? Like I said, it was supposed to be sung over multiple days, and I'm really going to breeze through most of it just to hit the major touchstones that will be of note to us later on. The first of set touchstones I'm going to talk about are the other members of the Twelve Peers, namely Oliver and Ogier the Dane. Oliver is one of the central characters of the song, serving as Roland's best friend and foil. While Roland is often rushing in and calling for heroics in battle, Oliver is the voice of reason in the room for the hot-headed paladin. In many ways, the two can be seen to represent what would become the most archetypical personality types of paladins. Roland is hot-headed and brash, with the thirst of justice that sometimes gets in the way of his clear mind and good reason. In contrast, Oliver is calm and focused, typically teaching lessons and attempting to parse things out before he rushes into something dangerous or unknown. They're basically lawful stupid and lawful good paladins, respectively. Ogier the Dane isn't hugely important in Shans on the Roland. He does appear as a commander of the rear guard and his fate is technically left unknown, but it's widely accepted that he's dead by the end of the song. Ogier is interesting for reasons that will come up later, but also because he's kind of a crossover character that regularly shows up in Arthur's Avalon, like some kind of 11th century Avenger. Either way, just remember his name for reasons. The other major thing I want to talk about while we're on Shans and Dev Roland is the idea of paladins and their divine swords, focusing specifically on Roland's own Durandal. Durandal was supposedly Charlemagne's own sword and imbued with just all sorts of holy artifacts and power. Roland ends up in possession of it before and during Shans on the Roland, and the blade is, uh, stupid? Literally, the weapon is anime protagonist levels of overpowered, supposedly so sharp and so powerful in Roland's hands that he single-handedly slew countless Cerisians with it. Near the end of the story, when Roland lay dying, he understands that he can't let Durandal fall into the hands of the enemy, so he tries to break it. He strikes it as hard as he can against the rock he's dying next to, and, in the story, creates Roland's breach. This. He creates this. This mountain pass, while trying to break the damn thing. This... this is ludicrous. And Roland isn't the only paladin with such a holy sword. Supposedly Oliver's own holy blade, Hot's Clear, was used to split enemy soldiers and horses in two with single blows. There's less information about this sword than Durandal, but come on guys, that's ridiculous. And, alright, anyways, holy swords and paladins, those are just... They, they go together really well. Finally, and admittedly not one of my touchstones, I want to talk about the Inishans and the Roland. Roland spends his dying moments hiding Durandal so that it can't be stolen and blowing on his horn so hard that he blows out his temples, ultimately killing him. In a major divergence from history, the song ends with Charlemagne's army reforming and upon hearing the sound of Roland's horn striking back against the Cerisians. Charlemagne's historical retreat is turned into a magnificent victory as he breaks the Cerisian horde and turns them back, though the price paid in blood is deep with the loss of all 12 of his peers. I bring this up because it, well, First off, shows that 11th century authors just love to embellish the truth, but also because it shows the unconquerable spirit of the Paladins. The story doesn't deliver any lies or misdirection about where it's ultimately going. Roland and the Peers are going to die by the end of it, and you know this from the beginning. The Peers themselves also understand that their fate is ultimately sealed. But they stay in fight, unwavering and unafraid. They bring down as much as they can, laying down their lives so that their Emperor may rally and ultimately avenge them. The Paladins put their oaths to their Emperor and God above their own lives, and these traits stay reflective in characteristics of Paladins all the way up to the modern day. Shans and Roland was obviously a major touchstone of French literature, and influenced a great deal of other literary works. It's not surprising that it would keep major staying power throughout the upcoming centuries, where it will end up having a massive impact on our modern day fantasies. Moving forward from the Shans and Roland, I'm going to touch briefly, briefly, on the Crusades. 
Mostly doing this because I realized my original draft of the script doesn't even mention them, and I feel like that's both a bit telling and a little dismissive of me. So I'm going to get this out of the way real fast. For those of you who somehow don't know what the Crusades are, here's a brief TLDR. In 1095, roughly around the same time that Jean de Dejes would have been growing in popularity, Pope Urban II called for what would become the First Crusade, a holy war against the Muslims. Like a lot of the stuff I've covered here, there's a lot more to this, but I said I'm here briefly, so just trust me when I say that this would become kind of a big deal. The Crusades would continue off and on for the next several centuries with varying degrees of success and basically the same degrees of horrifying violence every time. And the Crusades gave birth to several Crusader orders, basically collections of warriors whose job it was to fight for Christianity. These orders would include the Knight Templar, the Order of St. Lazarus, and the Knights Hospitaller, each with their own stories and histories that I don't have time for here. I bring up the Crusades and Crusaders because there's a pretty heavy connection between the concept of modern-day paladins and medieval Crusaders, and not entirely without reason. The Crusaders certainly saw themselves as holy warriors, and many of them likely grew up hearing Shans and the Roland and envisioning themselves as defenders of the cross like the paladins. But while the Crusader orders will and have influenced the depiction of modern-day paladins, they are not the start of that history. A part of it, definitely, but not the foundation of the whole story. I talked about Jean de Roland as long as I did for a reason, and these guys just don't quite line up for the same reasons. Crusaders aside, I could just move forward from there and move to the next major influence for D&D Paladins, but I have one more thing I want to cover. Mostly because I feel like it'd be absolutely remiss of me not to talk about it, but also because I think it'd be really silly of me to have a section of my video dedicated to have gun will travel. We're about as much man as a woodlouse. <laughs> Let me indulge on this, even if nobody else cares about the silly cowboy show, I really want to talk about it. When I first brought up the idea of doing these videos to my TTRPG illiterate father, he stopped me and said, is a paladin a cowboy? And that caught me admittedly flat-footed. And then I watched two hours worth of the show he was referencing. Mostly because I thought it was fascinating, but also because it's not that bad. Gene Ronberry wrote a few episodes of it, and while it's a product of its time, that doesn't necessarily make it terrible. If you're interested in late 50s westerns, I'd recommend it. But what's interesting here is in Have Gun Will Travel, Richard Boone plays a cowboy bounty hunter named Paladin that lives in 1870s California. Paladin is a mercenary, traveling all across the country to take jobs as they come up and often doing good deeds along the way. Paladin dresses dark on the job, but despite this, he's depicted as having a kind demeanor and a desire to help others. He often works for free or returns money for his clients if he feels as if they need it more than he does. Paladin's also a purposeful divergence of the more rough and tumble Western heroes of the era. He's a gentleman, capable of speaking multiple languages and quoting literature. He's clearly highly educated, an obvious scholar. The Greek phalanx was developed out of a specific need. They fought shoulder to shoulder on small battlefields, and they were considered invincible. And then the Macedonians hit them with cavalry. And that was the end of the phalanx. There are all sorts of tactics, Mr. Reed. Paladin also wields a custom gun, an all-black Colt 45 that's apparently built specifically for him with a unique trigger pressure and rifling that I guess wasn't common in handguns at that era. I don't think you got a very good look at this gun while you had it. Balance is perfect. This trigger responds to a pressure of one ounce. If you look carefully in the barrel, you'll see the lines of rifling. It's a rarity in a hand weapon. This gun was handcrafted to my specifications and I rarely draw it unless I mean to use it. Would you care for a demonstration? The weapon is unique to him and extremely dangerous in his hands. Paladin multiple times uses the gun to take down enemies and just generally win the day. Paladin's calling card is also interesting to me as it depicts a single white knight chess piece with the basic premise of what he does, owns guns, and travels written upon it. The white knight also appears embroidered onto Paladin's gun holster. He's a cowboy, self-named Paladin, with a gentlemanly level of education and noble demeanor. He's selfless, willing to risk himself and lose money in exchange for doing the right thing when he can. He has a weapon specifically built for him, and in multiple places he uses the chess piece representing the knight to represent himself. Paladin is just as his name implies, a Paladin of the 1870s as per depicted by 1957's television programming. It's just so interesting and cool to me that the idea exists here a full 20 years before Dungeons & Dragons would come out, and with so many of the same themes all because of what was established in Shans & De Roland. Sorry for rambling, but I just really wanted to talk about that. Moving back in time a little and back on track for our paladins, in 1954 J.R.R. Tolkien released The Lord of the Rings, and if I have to explain to you what that is, then you really need to go look up a few movies and books before finishing this video. 
Lord of the Ring took the world by storm, and its success spurred the entire world into a boom of fantasy writing. Dozens of authors came out of this boom, inspired by the works of Tolkien, but none in this post Lord of the Rings boom stands out more for our purposes than Joan Anderson in his release of the fantasy novel Three Hearts and Three Lions in 1961. Three Hearts and Three Lions details the stories of Holger Carlson, an engineer in World War II who ends up in a firefight attempting to escape from the Nazis. After taking a bullet, Holger awakens in a fantasy world with no knowledge of how he got there or how he's going to get back. The universe in question is a world where mythological figures like King Arthur are treated as historical fact, while figures from our history, such as Julius Caesar, are myths. Charlemagne and his twelve peers are also shown to be historical in this universe, which just has so many weird implications I can't really get into. The universe is torn between two primal forces, law, represented by Charlemagne's core and humanity, and chaos, represented by the elves and the fae. This mixed with a hodgepodge of fantasy creatures should ring wildly familiar to anyone who's had to look at an alignment chart for more than five seconds. Upon awakening, Holger finds a sword, a shield, and a set of armor that somehow perfectly fit him, and a horse that will become a stalwart and loyal companion throughout his coming adventures. He's joined by a woman who could turn into a swan named Alianora and a Scottish-accented dwarf named Hugi in his quest to go home. And at least early on, he ends up being impeded by the Duke of the Elves and several Fae trying to imprison him. And whilst all of this is going on, Morgan Le Fay keeps appearing and attempting to seduce him. There's, there's a lot happening in the book. The story is told through vignette S chapters, not unlike The Hobbit, with every chapter telling a small part of a much larger adventure. Ultimately, Holger discovers the easiest way for him to return home would be to recover a holy sword by the name of Cortana. No, not that one. Holger goes through several adventures, running into many foes including creatures such as werewolves, trolls who can only be killed by fire, and yes, a dragon. Throughout these adventures, Holger realizes he has mystical and divine powers, including superhuman strength, the ability to ward off the forces of chaos, and the ability to lay his hands on people to heal them. All of these should be sounding kind of familiar to you. In the end, Holger recovers Cortana, and with it he discovers that he is Olgir the Dane, the legendary paladin that I mentioned earlier in Shanzen the Roland. He defeats the forces of chaos before he's teleported back to his own world where he uses his newfound superhuman strength to defeat the Nazis and aid in the Allies' victory of World War II. The symbolism isn't exactly subtle. Afterwards, Holger converts to Catholicism and spends the rest of his days trying to get back to the world that he was previously in because he had fallen in love with Alianora through his adventures. Bing bang boom, book is finished. I'm sure there's a few more things in there, but that's the big parts of it. Three Hearts and Three Lions is a massively impactful book for more than just the paladins of D&D. In fact, D&D's very core has been partially shaped by this book. It's actually kind of a trip of how much Gygax's work comes from here. Shapeshifting druids? Alianora could turn into a swan. Stout, gruff dwarves with Scottish accents? Could be just as much Hugi as it could be Gimli at this point, though I don't remember the dwarves in Lord of the Rings having exclusively Scottish accents outside of the movies. Trolls that regenerate unless they're burned? If not done first by Three Hearts and Three Lions, then it was definitely done most prominently by the book during Gygax's time. On the paladin front, Holger's ability to lay his hands on the people to heal them is a shoe in for where Lay on Hands comes from. Holger's loyal horse would serve as a basis for the holy chargers that paladins got all the way up through 3.5. His ability to ward against the forces of chaos would become the paladins' auras. And his hunt for Katana and seeking of a holy blade would be pivotal in the definition of paladins in early D&D. As for other big things from this book, the original Dungeons and Dragon booklets released in 1974 by Gygax don't actually have an access for good and evil. Instead, characters are set on an axis of lawful, neutral, and chaotic just like the forces of Three Hearts and Three Lions. With all this in mind, it's easy to see that Three Hearts and Three Lions is just as impactful, if not more, than Tolkien's work for D&D. It's amazing that I didn't hear about this book until I started doing research for this video, because if Tolkien built the framework for D&D, Anderson actually built the house for what it became. And with my discussion of Three Hearts and Three Lions covered for now, that might be its own video later on. I think that's roughly where I come to an end with a historical section about paladins. There's definitely more I could go back into, but everything major is covered here. Paladins are a wild ride, starting way back from the founding of Rome on the Palatine and up to Joan Anderson's depiction of Ogier the Dane's story in Three Hearts and Three Lions. With this kind of historical context, there's really so many directions you could take a paladin in that would be really interesting to watch and see in a D&D game. But hey, that's for another time. If you stuck around through all this rambling, thank you so very much for watching. If you liked it, maybe you can hit the subscription button down below and like the video. I'd appreciate it a lot. If you were watching this hoping I would actually go through each edition of D&D talking about paladins, 
Well, first off, what kind of crazy person would do that? And second off, I'm the type of crazy person that would do that. That video is coming if it's not already up. It's just that I ended up making this all one video at one point, and it was just two hours long, and nobody would really want to watch it. It was really, really bad, guys. I, I split these up for a reason. But be ready, because next time on Historical Role, I'm going to dive into the rule books to discuss the changes and influences D&D's paladins have had over the years. We're going to be starting all the way where the original brown booklets released in 1974 and ending in 5e. So until then, keep an eye out and good rolling.